Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and the always yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers, that's right, moi, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am coming at you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post-Geek Singularity community, I'm, of course... Rob casting here from the Rob Observatory, and this is Rob Observations number 877. Oh my God, that's a lot. Well, listen, you know, uh, a lot of people, and I appreciate this, a lot of people say that they appreciate my knowledge of the film business, and I certainly don't purport to know everything. Uh, there's a lot smarter people than I do that know a lot, or than I am that know a lot more than I do. But, I have been a student of the entertainment business most of my life, and of course I've worked in the business, I've produced movies, I've directed a movie, uh, I've written a movie, I've written a few movies, but one's been produced. Um, so I've done things, you know, I've been a PA, I've been a story analyst, aka reader, um, I've done a lot of things, I've worked at agencies, I've worked at, at Warner Brothers, I've worked at production companies, I've done a lot of things. I have been fascinated by... SAG and the WGA strike and where the business is, where it's going, where it's been, all of those things. And people are always asking me to talk about how I feel about the strike and what's going on. And I read an article in the LA Times that was written by a writer who's on strike who wrote the show Suits. Now, I had heard about the show Suits and I to be truth be told, I had never watched it until it was in fact on Netflix. I had seen the only thing I'd seen of Suits. I, I knew two things. I knew Meghan Markle was in Suits, and I knew I had watched a clip from Suits, and I wasn't even aware where it fell in the series, where somebody is applying at a law firm to the managing partner or whatever. Uh, one handsome guy is talking to a younger handsome guy who has never passed the bar, but he has a photographic memory and he's memorized the entire uh, bar or whatever. He's all the legal precedents. Not, not, not he didn't memorize the. I memorized the entire bar, but this guy was able to pass the bar because he'd memorized all of these uh, the laws. And I'm sure you've seen the clip. And if you know Suits, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I thought this clip was really cool. I'm like, wow, I'm gonna watch Suits one day. So Suits shows up on Netflix. And I just started to watch it. And I'm like, I, lo I love legal. I mean, 12 Angry Men. I saw that when I was in high school. Love that. The Verdict is one of my favorite movies. Give me a good courtroom drama, whether it's A Few Good Men, whether it's Anatomy of a Murder, whether it's... Uh, give me anybody in, in court. I loved L.A. Law when it was on. I loved The Defenders, like E.G. Marshall back in the day, Even, yeah, ever since I was a kid. Give me, you know, Samuel Cogley in the episode Court Martial in Star Trek. Uh, legal thrillers are catnip for me. Um, and my God, the verdict. You know, if you haven't seen Sidney Lumet's 1972, 1982 film, The Verdict, starring Paul Newman, which he should have won his Oscar for instead of Color of Money. I'm just, not that Color of Money isn't great. Anyway, just watch it. So anyway, Suits is really good. <laughs> I mean, I haven't finished the first season, but I started watching it. And I'm like... It's really good. I wouldn't have watched it if it was not on Netflix. 
And there was an article about Suits that was written by a writer who's on strike who worked on Suits, but we're going to get to that later. I'm going to give you a bunch of background now, and it's going to be a little academic and maybe a little boring because I'm not going to rant about Star Trek or talk about Star Wars or anything like that. This is going to be a more erudite stream about the entertainment business and I just want to get some background information out to people so because people have been asking me and I, I didn't have a way in it until now so now I'm going to talk about suits the WJ strike and all that and we're going to start out by saying not not by saying I want to just give you a little bit of production background on suits suits first aired on June 23rd 2011 and uh, it ran 12 episodes that's when it started and it ended on September 25th, 2019, after nine seasons. Um, the executive producers are Aaron Korsh, Doug Lyman, that Doug Lyman, D uh, Dave uh, Bartis, and the producers are Gene Klein, Gabriel Macht, one of the actors who's the son of of uh, Stephen Macht, who I really like, who almost played Captain Picard. There you go. For you Star Trek fans, I had to fit it in there somewhere. Patrick Adams and J.M. Uh, I'm going to get this name wrong. Dangulian? Okay, now here's the important thing. Suits was produced by these production company, uh, companies. Untitled Korsh Company, Hypnotic Films and Television, Universal Content Productions, and Open for Business Productions, and it originally aired on the USA Network. Now keep those production companies in mind. You don't have to remember them, just know that there is one, two, three, four, four production companies that made Suits, and it aired on USA. Now let's put that aside. So that's some background. Now I want to table Suits for a minute. Now we're going to talk about the Writers Guild of America. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is one of the things that you've been hearing a lot about but might not know much about, which are residuals, residual payments. And basically what residual payments are, well... I'm going to tell you what residual payments are, and there's a very handy document that comes to us from a law firm, Cowan Debates Abram, or Abrahams, Abrahams, yes, and Shepard LLP, and this document is copyright 2022. I hope they don't, they don't bill me for this. I did find it on the internet, but I found this to be very useful, so I'm going to share it with you. Demystifying WGA Television Residuals. Under the Writers Guild of America Theatrical and Television Basic Agreement, the Basic Agreement, credited writers for television motion pictures, including episodic programs, are entitled to receive compensation for the reuse of their work, also known as residuals. Television residuals were first negotiated by the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, in 1953, under the theory that a rerun of an existing program reduces the employment for new products, meaning if you can rerun something over again, somebody doesn't make need to make something new. So whoever created that should be compensated because they're not making something new. So, I like that. Reduces employment for new products. Consequently, residuals are payable for the reuse of a writer's material, as opposed to the original exhibition, which they were paid for when they wrote it in the first place by the company or production companies that were paying for and own the show. Though initially limited to programs made for television, and to five rerun payments, residuals expanded over the years, not only to include home video, paid television, cable, new media, and others, but also to payments in perpetuity. Whether or not a television writer is entitled to receive residuals is ultimately governed by the WGA's credit determination. Per the basic agreement, which expired, by the way, the latest one in May of this year, May of 2023, if the guild accords a written by credit to a writer, such individual is entitled to receive 100% of available residuals, 
while a writer that is accorded a teleplay by credit can claim 75% of available residuals. By the way, this was written in 2018, I believe, even though it's copyright in 2022. I think this was written in 2018. Um, if the writer is accorded a teleplay by credit, can claim 75% of available residuals. If the guild accords only a story by credit to the writer, he or she is entitled to receive 25% of available residuals. Furthermore, for an episodic series, if a writer were entitled to separation of rights and created by credit on the series, such writer would be entitled to a residual on the creator sequel payment minimum payable for each episode of the series produced beyond the pilot. That has to do with previously existing characters, and for the sake of this argument, I won't get into that. For projects made for television, there are two forms of residual calculations. For the first category, residuals for each exhibition, each time it's played, are a set amount generally based on a fixed residual base as determined by the following factors. One, the duration of the program. Two, the budget of the program. Three, the contract year. And four, the number of reruns. Such calculation is applicable to reuse on ABC, CBS, NBC, SBC, the CW, syndication market, high-budget SVOD, and others. Specifically, for new high-budget SVOD programs, the initial compensation paid to the credited writer includes 90 days of use worldwide on the original platform. For domestic use on such platform after the first 90 days, the studio must pay a residual amount determined by the residual base exhibition year percentage and the subscriber factor. Now, I know that's a bunch of gobbledygook to most people, but what's important here is that the studio, and the studio means who made the show, who owns the show, who produced the show, the studio that made the show, that paid for it to get made. That's very important. The second type of residual calculation is a revenue-based calculation where residuals payable is based on a percentage of revenues received by the studio or the distributor. Let me read that again. The second type of residual calculation is a revenue-based calculation where residuals payable is based on a percentage of revenues received by the studio or the distributor. The second formula is applicable, among others, to reuse on basic cable, AVOD, and other than high-budget SVOD programs. Now, let me give you a few things about that and so you know what that means. What is SVOD? First of all, uh, well, I'm going to tell you. Um, SVOD is short for Subscription Video On Demand, a video monetization model where subscribers pay a flat subscription fee in return for unlimited access to a massive library of video content ad-free. The subscription fee may be charged at any fixed interval, but it is most often a monthly or annual payment. And once a user pays, they can watch as much content as they want for that period. Aside from the platforms mentioned above, other major OTT platforms include HBO Max, Hulu, Paramount Plus, Showtime, Apple TV, ESPN, and Peacock, obviously. Uh, this type of model is so prevalent in the streaming industry due to the recurring nature of the subscription fees. This would also apply to Disney Plus, all those things. To give you an idea of how widespread the usage of SVOD as a monetization model in the industry is, figure this. Over 1.88 billion people, 43.2% of internet users, use subscription video services worldwide. And this number is only expected to grow. Now, SVOD isn't restricted to entertainment platforms like the ones mentioned above. There's a host of platforms running on an SVOD model for other genres like esports, sports, e learning, fitness, health, and wellness. SVOD platforms are massively popular, so much so that it begs the question can it replace 
cable TV. Now that's so you know, that's what Netflix is, obviously. Um, and that's what is defined there. What is AVOD? AVOD is advertising based video on demand. And that is a model where video content is made available for viewing on the internet and supported by advertisements. Advertisements are integrated into the viewing experience appearing before, during, and after video content. So there's SVOD and ad-based VOD. So anyway, with respect to reruns on basic cable, residuals are generally calculated either on one, a cable formula of applying descending percentages to applicable cable minimums, commonly known as the Sanchez formula, referring to the show Sanchez of Bel Air, for which the formula was first used, or two, a Hitchcock formula, named after the show Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which is 120% of the difference between the corresponding network primetime minimum and the applicable cable minimum for 12 reruns over five years. For AVOD reuses, the studio is initially uh, entitled to a residual free streaming window for seven consecutive days. Then for each 26 week period following the streaming window, it must make five and one half percent effective May 2nd, 2018 of the applicable other than the network primetime minimum. It goes on. For other original new media programs, other than high-budget SVOD programs, the first 26 weeks are residual free, but thereafter a distributor must pay one and one-fifth percent of gross receipts. However, now remember, the distributor is usually the studio or the owner of the programming. It's their programming, so there you go. However, such obligation is only applicable if the budget for the program was at least $25,000 per minute. Otherwise, the payment of residuals is freely negotiable. Although methods of WGA residual calculation are varied and complex, they are a critical part of the entertainment industry that is responsible for compensating writers and inspiring the creation of television programs. Residual payment obligation generally follows the program's success. Accordingly, Residuals are quite positive for the writer and the studio alike. Now, I just wanted to give you that background. So what happens is normally what happens since the 50s when this was first calculated is that there used to be only three television networks and then local programming. And if you were the studio or the distributor, and usually they were one and the same back in the day, you would get paid, a writer would get paid to work on a show. And say Star Trek, there was 26 episodes a season. You'd have a writer's room. They'd have outside writers come in, but you'd have a core group of writers that worked on the show. And some of them would get to write their own episodes where they would get a written by. They might get a teleplay by based on a story by someone else. So within, within WJ rules, there's a lot of jockeying in writer's rooms to get their names as written by a single name becomes a lot more lucrative than if you just get a story by credit. That's a show for another time. I'm just saying that, you know, when you look at shows that are written, Babylon 5 was predominantly written by J. Michael Straczynski, or the first four seasons of The West Wing were predominantly written by Aaron Sorkin. There were other writers, yes, but if you're a writer and you've created a show, residuals can be a very lucrative thing. Now, in television, what would happen is Television usually works, it's made at a deficit. Television is usually losing money for the first couple of years. But if a show catches on and becomes successful, by the time you get to the usual formulas, year four, year five, then people are starting to make some big money. And then what happens is if a show is that successful and you have a 100-episode syndication package, then it gets sold internationally. So what happens is, the distributor or the studio can sell that show over and over again. They'll sell it to France, they'll sell it to Germany, they'll sell it to the UK. And each one of those sales based on territory, they get a ton of money. And so residuals get paid out of that. So the people that are involved in those shows 
they make a lot of money. You get residual payments because every time they sell it, you're entitled to a residual payment. But remember, each residual payment is on a scale of diminishing returns, depending on what you've negotiated. So eventually, residuals kind of run out. So keep that in mind. And I will bring up the example once again that Friends, for instance, that was made by some production companies, but mostly Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers owns Friends. In 2019, Warner Brothers sold the rights. They licensed the rights of Friends to Netflix for $100 million. Now, I want to be clear. Netflix doesn't owe any residuals by showing Friends. They have paid a licensing fee to the owners of Friends to show Friends for a year. But Netflix paid through the nose a $100 million payment to show Friends for one year is huge. Does Netflix owe any residual payments to actors? They have to figure that out. No, they do not. They have paid the studio and the distributor, who are basically one and the same, $100 million. The studio, first of all, the studio is what is called a signatory to the WGA. The studio Warner Brothers has said to the Writers Guild, we will abide by your rules. So whatever the rules are that the WGA sets down, Warner Brothers has to abide by those rules. And because Friends is an old show, Whatever the WJ rules are and how people get diminishing returns and all that, you have to abide by those WJ rules. The studio has to abide by WJ rules, and the writers that are part of the Writers Guild also have to abide by those rules. Now, here's something that in 1955 could never have been contemplated. No one would have ever thought that a show that had gone to become very successful, you know, Uh, And then, of course, it sold into syndication, reruns, but even reruns run out after a while. And the more a show is rerun, the older it gets, the less and less and less and less it's worth anything. But with streaming services, something interesting and unique happened. People liked their comfort food. And when you could subscribe to a streaming service and it would have a show like Friends on it, I know people that watch, well, that... I had a friend that used to watch uh, Monk, and she would just leave the show on. It would play episode after episode after episode. So what would happen is Netflix would pay $100 million, and you might get a billion or two billion or three billion, however many billions of hours of, of watch time out of Friends. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how many people watched it on Friends. Uh, it doesn't matter how many people watch Friends on Netflix. What matters is Netflix paid $100 million to the people that owned Friends. So Netflix, they've done their part. It doesn't matter how many people are watching Friends on Netflix. It could be 10 people, it could be 100 million. Netflix paid what they thought it was worth, what they felt comfortable paying, which was a tidy sum. It's up to the makers of the show, the people that own the program, to pay out residuals. All right? Now, Netflix, when they are the studio and they are their own distributor and they're paying for a show to get made, like if they say to Mike Flanagan, yo, do House of Usher for us, man, they are paying for the show. And then Netflix is the studio. And Netflix has to be, they have to abide by WJ rules. If they're a signatory, and they are because they're a production company, they have to abide by WJ rules. Now, Netflix doesn't necessarily like that because they only have one revenue stream, which is their own. So they're not going to sell their shows to France, Germany, England, whatever. So all they're going to make is whatever they take in from their subscriptions. That's all the money Netflix makes. So here's something interesting that happened between the WJ and Netflix. And this happened back in, I'm going to read this article, it's by Katie Kilkenny, and this was written August 4th, 2022, and it's in the Hollywood Reporter. 
Writers Guild arbitration with Netflix yields $42 million in new residuals for members. The Writers Guild told members on Thursday that an arbitration with Netflix over the 2018 Sandra Bullock film Bird Box has resulted in members receiving $42 million in previously unpaid residuals. A third-party arbiter in the Bird Box case found that Netflix had underpaid residuals on the film, according to the Guild. Thus, awarding the film's writer $850,000 in total residuals with $350,000 in interest. A rival screenwriter, Eric Heiserer, wrote the film based on the novel of the same name by Josh Mallerman. I read that book, actually. As a direct result of this ruling, 216 writers on 139 other Netflix theatrical films Now, this is interesting because uh, I'll give you an aside. Well, let me finish reading this. On 139 Netflix theatrical films are receiving an additional 42 million in unpaid residuals. The Writers Guild of America East wrote to members in an email on Thursday. The Guild is now pursuing approximately 13.5 million in interest Netflix also owes for writers for late payment of those residuals. The Hollywood Reporter has reached out to Netflix for comment. Now, it's very interesting because Netflix, and this is something that's a little crazy, when they're making a movie, even though they might not be releasing something theatrically, they're basically making not a TV movie, but a theatrical film, even though it's only going to air on Netflix. It's very weird. When I produced a movie called The Hills Run Red for Warner Brothers back in 2008. We had WJ member Dave Scow come on board. He helped develop the script before it was even sold and before he even made it. But when we flipped the movie to Warner Brothers and we were going to make it independently for $350,000 and we ended up teaming up with Joel Silver's Dark Castle Entertainment and making it for Warner Premiere, which was their direct-to-video division, which means it's going direct-to-video, The Writers Guild had not changed their rules, so that was considered a teleplay. A teleplay. Not a screenplay, but a teleplay, which means less money for Guild writer Dave Scow. And I actually went to bat. I'm like, why are you calling it a teleplay? It's not made for television, but it was direct-to-video, so theoretically it was made for television, sort of, even though it had its world premiere and played around the world at various festivals in a theater. It was still considered to be a teleplay, and he was paid based on the WGA writing schedule based on teleplay. That was interesting. I was like, I even called the Guild and talked to people. They were, to be honest, not very helpful about this. I said, it's not on television, you know, but it's direct-to-video. I'm like, yeah, but it's not aired on TV. There's no ad-based tier for it, no commercials. It's a movie. It just happens. It's a a theatrical movie made by two theatrical companies. It was made by Warner well, Warner Premiere, which is a division of Warner, and Dark Castle Entertainment. Anyway, I went to bat. I lost. According to the Guild, the Netflix dispute rose from Netflix's entry into producing their own films written by WGA members rather than relying on third-party production companies. See, it used to be that Netflix would have other people make movies for them and license those movies. But then they became their own production company, so they're the studio and the distributor, which means they have to pay residuals. Now, to be fair, this was new for them. Once you become your own, I mean, they they had started making shows like House of Cards, but when they made House of Cards, check this out. They didn't know how they were going to do that because no one figured that shit out. And to this day, they really still haven't. But anyway... So according to the Guild, the dispute arose from the Netflix entree into producing their own films written by WGA members rather than relying on third-party production companies. In 2016, Netflix had negotiated terms with fellow entertainment unions, the Directors Guild of America, and SAG-AFTRA, who are also on strike now, that let the streamer pay residuals on significantly less than the cost of the film, the Guild says and sought to apply those same terms to the WGA via pattern bargaining. 
So basically, the WGA and SAG agreed to give Netflix a break, and Netflix just said, yo, they expected the WGA to do the same thing. However, the Guild maintained that the streamer needed to heed the terms of its theatrical and television basic agreement. That's the WGA, which maintains that the writers are initially paid when their film is theatrically released and then receive residuals based on what the distributor earns when licensing or exhibiting the film on other platforms, such as streaming or home video. The typical residual for the credited writer is 1.2% of the license fee paid to the producer for the right to exhibit that film. The WGA East wrote to members, when a distributor is both producer and distributor of a film title, as Netflix was with Bird Box, the WGA requires companies to calculate the license fee by looking at the license fee paid out to third-party producers on similar films. So, Netflix was now the producer and the distributor of the movie, and what the WGA wanted, because this is a new thing, streamers were new, the WGA wanted <laughs> Netflix to basically license its own produced movie to itself and abide by those fees, which is kind of weird because this is a new, a new system. It's something new, but the WGA, like, like a lot of what's going on now, they wanted to apply older paradigms and older rules to something new, which was Netflix producing its own movies that it was going to distribute itself on its own platform, but the WJ hadn't figured that out yet, so they wanted to go back to an old model and base residuals that Netflix would pay on that old model. Just, just pointing that out. So once again, when a distributor is both producer and distributor of a film title, as Netflix was with Bird Box, the WGA requires companies to calculate the license fee by looking at license fee paid out to third-party producers on similar films. So, Which is kind of weird that the WGA is going, okay, Netflix, you're producing your own movies and you're distributing them. We want you to look at other movies that have nothing to do with you that are owned and distributed, maybe theatrically distributed by a movie studio, and we want you to pay those rates. And so Netflix is like, um, why? Why should we do that? But anyway, they agreed. The critical definition negotiated as part of the resolution of our strike in 2008 protects against the undervaluation of licensing fees through self-dealing. So this is a problem. This has been a problem. Uh, we saw it with the X-Files, for instance. The X-Files, which is made by Fox, suddenly goes to FX and syndication. So Fox is basically selling their own show back to themselves at a reduced cost. Because why would they pay top dollar for their own programming? So what happens is the writers lose out, the actors lose out, because it's like, yo, man, you, you can't, you got to sell it at top dollar. You're obligated to like, you can't just sell it to FX or whatever for reruns. So there were lawsuits, and I understand why. Because when you're talking about residuals, the concept was created in the 1950s. And as the industry has grown and changed and evolved, the Writers Guild, the guilds have been behind the curve. Why they're not thinking 10 years down the line, I don't know. And I think that's a problem in my own mind. They should be anticipating these things. And they're always behind the eight ball when they're, when they're negotiating. The world has moved on. And they're like, well, we have to negotiate. And they're always running behind the changes. And so they're arguing for things based on old paradigms where they should be five years down the line. And, I mean, I don't know why the guilds don't, you know, hire futurists to be like, where are we at now? Why are we arguing these things when we should be way out in front of the studios? Because the studios are out in front of them, I'll tell you that. But anyway, so the critical definition negotiated as part of the resolution of our strike in 2008 protects against the undervaluation of licensing fees through self-dealing. The WGA East wrote to members arguing that Netflix was underpaying residuals based on low-balled license fees. And why wouldn't they? They're paying residuals to them, you know, their their production entity is their distribution entity, so why would they, if they can get away with it, of course they're going to pay lower fees. Of course, because they're, they're both the distributor and the studio. 
Um, during the proceeding, the Guild told members that it argued Netflix should use the cost plus model it often uses with third party producers to also calculate its license fee for Netflix produced films, which is so weird. <laughs> According, but I understand why. According to the Guild, the arbiter de determined that Netflix's licensing fee on its own projects should amount to 111% of the gross budget of a film. Okay, WGA, thanks. I'm sure Netflix was was like, you know what, you guys? Thank you for setting that one up for us. I can only imagine. The Guild says bird, the Bird Box ruling has now affected residuals paid out on 139 additional Netflix films, including the additional residuals awarded as a result. The 216 screenwriters of these films have now received a total of $64 million in residuals, which is $20 million more than they would have received under the deal accepted by the DGA and SAG. The WGA East writes, The Guild adds, Netflix is thus far refusing to pay interest on the late residuals for films other than Bird Box, so the Guild is pursuing an arbitration, the $13.5 in interest still owed to these screenwriters. In its message to members, the WGA East drew a connection between this ruling and the upcoming negotiations with the studios and streamers over the Guild's film and television basic agreement, which will expire in the spring of 2023. Those negotiations are widely expected to be contentious as the Guild seeks to make up for ground loss during the 2020 negotiations on the contract during the onset of the pandemic and to significantly change the current streaming status quo for members. Netflix, with only a decade of experience employing writers, has quickly become one of the worst violators of the minimum basic agreement, acquire, or requiring the Guild to expend significant resources to protect writers who work for the company, the WGA East wrote. The upcoming 2023 minimum basic agreement negotiation challenges us to address the industry's rush to use the growth of the streaming model to depress pay and working conditions for Hollywood talent. It is our hope that writers and all Hollywood labor will receive their fair share of the value we together create. So I wanted to bring that up because here's 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 something to consider if you're warner brothers and you've made a movie and you are the production company you've made friends or whatever once you've made friends friends showed on network television and the people that you license it to say was it nbc that showed friends was a part of their thursday night lineup like will and grace i don't remember i never watched friends during its first run forgive me but anyway, every time Friends aired, advertisers, well, there was a licensing fee, and the NBC was charging money to advertisers because Friends was a hit show, and they got a lot of money for that. They, and, and so, so NBC pays a licensing fee to Warner Brothers, and that licensing fee that NBC pays, um, that's where, that was the money that the studio took in the distributor took in, and that's where the residuals get paid out based on how many times it runs, and then NBC charges more money. They make money because they charge for advertising. The streamers, the Netflix business model, their only income is what you pay for your subscription. That's it. There's no other money coming in. So those subscriptions, like when you buy a Netflix subscription, you pay every month, you get to see everything on the platform. So all of the money coming into Netflix has to pay for everything that's there. Everything. Whatever they're li paying for a licensing fee, it all has to be paid for by subscriptions. So here's the thing. Netflix, when they paid $100 million for Friends, it was already popular so they could see the analytics on how many people watch. So they're keeping their new subscribe or they're keeping their old subscribers happy and they hope people that want to watch friends will come in 2019 and pay more money and they'll get more subscriptions. But here's the thing, Netflix has to pay for everything on their platform from those subscriptions. That's it. They don't license out like when Netflix makes Bird Box, maybe they'll release it theatrically or something uh, foreign territories, but they won't because Netflix wants to be all around the world. So when Netflix is now paying ridiculously large sums of money to make something like The Gray Man or they're making Red Notice with 
Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Gal Gadot and Ryan Reynolds, and they pay $200 million. Netflix is shelling out $200 million, and they're hoping that their subscription base will pay for that. Now, when Netflix has paid that much money, where's any money to pay residuals? That's See, this is the problem. Netflix is like, well, wait a minute. And the Writers Guild says, well, when you're paying $200 million for a movie, that's like you're making a $200 million James Cameron movie. So we expect you to treat your movie like it's a normal $200 million, a normal, it's $200 million movie from the studios. But, but Netflix and Netflix's defense, they're like, well, we're not putting it out theatrically, so there's no revenue coming in. And then we're not licensing out the movie to anybody else, so it's not playing on airplanes, it's not coming out on physical media, it's not playing around the world. You know, movies now make more money theatrically foreign than they do domestic. So when Netflix makes something, that's it. It doesn't go anywhere else. There's no additional revenue stream. So with everything else there is, the studio makes a movie, they release it theatrically, they release it on SVOD, AVOD, they release it on planes, they release it all around the world. So it's generating money. There's a revenue stream. There's money coming in that you can clock and be like, okay, this movie made this much money. And, and when this much money come, gets taken in, they look at the how much money's there, they look at the WGA percentages, and they pay them. They pay the residuals or whatever is due, whatever you negotiate, because the money is coming in. That's the same way that television worked too. The streamers don't have that. They're not making any more money beyond what they've made from their subscriptions. So there is no more additional money. Now, I hope I've done a pretty good job. I hope you're not all bored to tears. Um, before I move on and continue, I would like to um, uh, just answer some questions. Um, chemist says, if money is what you want, then take it, Tom. Um, Tom, Tom deserves way more money than he'll ever get from me. So if you want to pay Tom, you should. Scott Bartholomew says, curious as to what residual Shatner gets. If you're talking about Star Trek, I believe that, uh, and I this I do not know. William Shatner, this is something I heard. I, I, I heard this might be apocryphal. I heard at one point Paramount went to Nimoy and Shatner and bought, bought them out and paid them each $25 million. Maybe they paid more, maybe they paid less, but that makes sense. The studio is like, we're buying your likenesses in perpetuity forever. Just like James Earl Jones sold his uh, voice, his performance as Darth Vader to Disney. And that's, this is why a lot of uh, recording artists are selling their entire catalog. Bruce Springsteen or whatever, Bowie, is selling their entire catalog for $300 million, $500 million. They buy the whole kit and caboodle and all of Bowie's music, all of Springsteen's music, all the masters, everything is owned by somebody forever in perpetuity and it's up to them how they're going to monetize it but that's why people are doing that you get a one-time only payment it's all done no more residuals no nothing i think it works pretty well glenn mark says for fun i'd like to drop some time stamps for 874 hey please do drop those time stamps um scott bartholomew says are residuals equal between music and film and tv no a, a lot of it has to do with the budget and music is totally different than movies. Uh, Glenn Mark says, Modern Trek is a poor reflection of the original series. Robbed Star Trek Season 2, Episode 4. <laughs> Mirror error. <laughs> it's true. Um, Irene Jobson uh, asks, If I write a book, will you read it? Yes. And if you make it an erotic thriller, um, I'll tell you something. Off the top of my head, uh, Brett Easton Ellis' book, Glamorama, has a three-way menage a trois sex scene. That's one of the hottest things I've ever read. And uh, yeah, a lot of people might, it might be put off because I think it's two guys and a girl. But if you can write a book that has those kinds of sex scenes, I guarantee you I'll read it. I promise. By the way, I heard Roger Avery had the rights to make Glamorama. Why didn't somebody make that movie? I really would love to have seen Brett Easton Ellis' Glamorama. I love that book. I read it twice. Um... Uh, Scott Bartholomew says, working in Hollywood seems lucrative, but the timing of getting paid for your work appears to be bastardized. Uh, working in Hollywood is a lot less lucrative than most people think. Like, like just about any profession, if you're at the top of your game and you can command big salaries, yes. But it's hard out there, and people don't make nearly as much money as you might think. 
Now, it used to be that television was unbelievably lucrative. Television was way more lucrative than movies, for the most part. Um, because you could sell the same thing over and over and over and over again. And if you owned it, if you're like an Aaron Spelling, and you owned and you could sell all of your shows, you became you could buy one of the biggest mansions in America. Those days are over. And that's a lot of what uh, people are, are, are striking about. They want to get more money for their work. The problem is... You know, you're striking at a time when the streaming services are way overextended. Everybody thought the getting was going to be so good, and it turned out not to be that good because people are listening to Wall Street and they don't know fuck out, of, fuck all about uh, uh, entertainment. So it's 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 crazy. Uh, Ron C says, "Hello, Robin. Strange new worlds." Kirk mentions to Laan that he has a child on the way. I bet in season three, Doctor Carol Marcus will be introduced with a child, David Marcus. Kirk becomes captain and takes off. Soap opera drama thoughts. Uh, I think you're probably right, you know. But I would say that we know and start. This is what I don't get. Why is it that the producers of this show have built their entire program around previous, previously existing material? Whether they're ripping off Ursula K. Le Guin and those who walk away from Umlas, whether they're ripping off episodes or issues of Star Trek: The Early Voyages, the Marvel Star Trek comic about Captain Pike. Or whether just they can't get away from the original series. It's amazing to me that creators of a TV show wouldn't be creating new characters. Like, why wouldn't they? The Writers Guild talks about that. Why wouldn't you want to create new characters? I don't know. Uh, Darth Plato <laughs> leaves an apple. Thanks, Darth Plato. Uh, you can leave an apple. I appreciate that. And the Richard has been a member here for 16 months. So, uh, um, all right, and, and uh, we're tip-free. If you want to leave a tip and don't want to use a super chat, you can. The, the, the tip function is in the description of the show. Um, I always say that kind of thing. So, it's a different world now. Um, and, and there's a lot of, I mean, here's the thing. Everybody wants to pay less money for, and, and here's the funny thing. It, by not paying the writers... What you are doing is you're building a less, you're building a substandard foundation because all the studios have to sell is entertainment. And for scripted entertainment, doesn't it make sense that you'd want the best scripts possible? That you would, you know, it used to be, I remember when I moved to LA, there was an ad agency called Chiat Day. And it was down by the beach in Venice. And there was like a giant sculpture of a, binoculars out front and when when advertising everybody knew that the 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 talent in advertising in the modern day the creatives you wanted to keep them as creative as possible so when you brought them into that work environment they had everything they needed all the comforts of home so they could just be free to create well you'd think you'd want the same thing with writers because let me tell you um i having known a lot of tv writers in my life if I was making a TV show, the first thing I would do is make sure my writers were taken care of. Now, I know it's expensive, but I'll tell you something. Why is it, and I keep harping on this show, why is it they spent $300 million to make six episodes of Citadel when they weren't the greatest scripts you'd ever read? I don't get it. I don't understand. What you want is a, an, a crack team of writers. And I'll tell you something, uh, not just because I've known him, I got to meet him last year, but um, I had watched Terry Metalis's show that he show ran, The 12 Monkeys. They made a movie of Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys. Terry Gilliam's movie was based on Chris Marker's short La Jete. So they made a 12 Monkeys show. Four seasons. The writing staff was, was, was pretty close-knit. And if you watch 12 Monkeys as a science fiction show, and if you're interested in time travel, it's an incredibly well-scripted series. You could tell that those writers were working very closely to create, within the context of doing 12 Monkeys and doing a riff on Terry Gilliam's movie, which was a riff on Chris Marker's movie, that they came up with something that was really good. And I'll tell you, uh, to truth be told, Terry himself gave me a beautiful box set from Via Vision Down Under in Australia. Hey, Disney, in your face, they're still making great physical media in Australia that people all over the world are buying. 
Via Vision, Imprint, and Umbrella. Come on, support. Anyway, it was a really well-written show. Well, when you have a great group of writers that understand their subject matter, especially a time travel science fiction show, what do you come up with? A great show. Now, they didn't have a lot of money to make that show, but they were really clever, really creative, and they stretched every dollar on that show, and it's a satisfying experience. That's why this, a lot of this crack writing team came and worked on Star Trek Picard Season 3. People that knew their stuff. People that knew science fiction. People that had actually pondered the science fiction genre as opposed to jumping on using a science fiction show as just your next, hey, I used to write for the Carrie Diaries, which, by the way, admittedly was a good show, but if you wrote for the Carrie Diaries and maybe the Magicians, what the hell do you know about science fiction? Much less Star Trek. Don't know, but somebody hires you for the job, and then what do we get? Bad science fiction. But okay, writers need to get paid because the written word is the very basis of all storytelling. So what happens? There's no longer 26 episode seasons. There's now 10 episode seasons and they're not giving the writing staffs enough time, which by the way is so dumb because when you think about it, when you watch, pick your favorite TV show, whether it's the first four seasons of West Wing, whether it's House of the Dragon, look at the Emmy Award winners today. Look at Succession. Do you think, when you think about Succession, do you think about the amazing special effects? Remember that time that... Um, the, the two planes collided in succession and all those people uh, got killed and it drove down the stock price to, um, oh wait, you don't remember that scene? You don't remember that scene? You know why you don't remember it? Because it wasn't in the fucking show. Because they didn't need special effects. It was people in a room talking. And some of those scenes, they would let a whole, they played out some of those scenes in wonders that lasted almost 30 minutes. You know why they worked? Because writers made it great. You need great writing. You need time. You need to allow a writing staff to come in and gel and figure that shit out. And they're not getting that time. And this is the problem. Writers need to be paid because the very basis of all the entertainment we consume, unless it's unscripted reality program, but let's face it, that's written too. Uh, we need writers. We need writers. However, we also need people that understand the economics of the business. And this is problematic. I know as a low-budget film producer and editor and post-supervisor, my job went from picture cutting in the mid-90s to having to learn to do everything from making 3D titles to using Photoshop to do animation. My skill set had to like be broadened. And did I get paid more money for that? No. The job of the editor... When I was working, you know, on certain things, when I was working at Kids WB with Kevin Rubio, making his amazingly well-written uh, promo spots for Kids WB, the man was a genius. I had to know a lot more than just picture cutting in order to make 30-second promos. That's just the nature of the beast. That's what computer technology has done. But anyway, big fan of writers, love books, love great screenplays. We need great writing, but we also need people that understand the economics of everything. Now, um, S. Beam has been a member of the channel for 33 months. By the way, we had a, I want to say we have every two weeks, if you're a member of the channel, we have a member call. And today we had a three-hour member call. It was really great. A couple of new members I hadn't met before who were terrific. Great to see you. Thanks for supporting the channel. And uh, it was a great member call. So S Beam's been a member for 33 months. Wow, Rob, I've enjoyed every single second of being a member of the PGS. I promise your 1-6 scale figure is still coming. It's okay. Life just gets in the way of your hobby sometimes. Much love and respect. Well, S Beam, take as much time as you can. Maybe I'll, I'll send you a detailed photo essay on my jacket. <laughs> uh, Drew Gordon has been a member for two months. Hi, Rob, I love your work. Random question. Uh, did you watch and enjoy Ten Cent's Three Body Show? And how optimistic are you are how optimistic are you about the upcoming Netflix version? Uh, okay, so for those of you who don't know, Shizhen Lu, the Chinese science fiction author, wrote, of course, the Remembrance of Earth pa Earth's Past trilogy, uh, which is the Three Body Problem, the Dark Forest, and Death's End. 
Uh, three Body Problem won a Hugo Award. I've read the Three Body Problem. I have not read the other two books. Um, so Weiss and Benioff, the creators of uh, Game of Thrones, um, th- of the show, are making the TV series based on the three. It's called the Three Body Problem here, and it debuts on Netflix in January. I'm very excited for that. However, the Chinese beat them to the punch. They made, I think it's like 33 episodes, 33 hour long episodes, and they're available for free on YouTube on Tencent's channel. And by the way, I highly recommend them. If you are a science fiction fan, now it's a bit of a slow burn, to be honest. And you kind of have to get used to the credits and stuff. It's the, the, the formatting is not necessarily what you're used to. It's an acquired taste even for foreign TV. But I can't recommend the show highly enough. I loved it. I thought it was, it, there's, there are changes, but I thought it was a terrific adaptation. It's just called Three Body. So if you want to watch it, check it out. It's good stuff. Uh, watch it. So Three Body, I thought it was really, really good. Um, so, yeah, check that out. Um, so Drew, yeah, I liked it. Tom Jr. Jackson says, why is Walter Koenig telling people to see him before he dies? Is he telling us something we don't know? Um, all I know is that Walter Koenig, we interviewed him. I was I was fortunate enough to be on the Inglorious Trexperts episode he was on. He's a bit cantankerous. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily read something into it, although I think he's just trying to be darkly sardonic, maybe. Although, on the flip side, I, I don't know anything. Um, I read that as well. I actually retweeted that comment. Um you know, I, my whole thing is when people start to get up in years, if, if you wanted to ever meet somebody, don't wait. Don't wait around. So he's right. I think what he said, come see me before I die. I mean, it might be a little dark. I chuckled at it. I retweeted it. I don't necessarily think that it means he's relatively sick or something, but maybe we don't know. I don't know. Scott Bartholomew says, why are TV, season, why are TV series seasons split out? Half a season in the fall, resume in the spring. It's maddening. Well, it's because, you know, TV's changed. When you have not as many episodes, I mean, before the TV season would traditionally start in September. You had the great TV Guide fall preview issue. Kids are like, TV Guide, what's that? It was a weekly periodical that had every TV show that was on. And for somebody who loved TV and movies, it was fantastic because when I got my VCR, in 1980, I could look and see what movies were showing late night. Could I get a Hammer movie? Could I get some obscure science fiction thing I hadn't seen? Could I get Barbara Eden in The Stranger Within, which is a TV movie, maybe a little Bad Ronald, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark action? You never knew. That's what the TV guide was for. And hell, when Bad Ronald was on again, I'm like, yeah. By the way, Warner Archive, you can get Bad Ronald. You can also get uh, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. You can get a lot of those great TV movies. I think you can even get Killdozer from them now, which is based on a story of a, one of the writers of Star Trek. Uh, but anyway, I'm, you know, it's all... So that's why they do it. They, they don't have the long 26-episode seasons that would run from September to May or even into June, which would encompass the whole year other than the holiday season. So they split, they split uh, if it's a successful show, like if it's a Taylor Sh- Sheridan show, they'll give you half up front, half months away, spread out, so you get goodness throughout the year. It's kind of maddening. I understand. It's just uh, things have changed. Things have changed. But I know. I see it's maddening. Um, Glenn Mark says, Season 3, Episode 1 of Modern Trek, Spock's Bane. <laughs> to crash your starship. Um, that would actually be pretty funny. Uh, Thomas Logan. Oh. <laughs> I was like, wow, Thomas, you got me there. Thomas Logan says, breaking per variety. Bad Robot exits Paramount, opens own studio, will pay streaming writers proper wages. Other studios follow suit, WGA strike over. Um, so here's the problem. It's all about where do you, where's the money that you have to have money coming in before you can pay the wages out. And when everybody's working in the red, there's no money. Like, how are the streamers supposed to pay... Um, with money they don't have. And the problem is the streamers spent a lot more money than they probably should have, but if they didn't spend the money, would they have the subscription base? It's really sort of a chicken and the egg thing. I, it's a tough one, and I don't, I don't know the answer to it. But now I would like to get to the point of this stream and what, I, what, what made me want to do this stream. 
And the first thing is an article that appeared in the LA Times. Now, this was after, let's take it back to the beginning of this stream when I was talking about uh, suits. And I'd seen that clip and I, I watched Suits and I'm like, this show is delightful. I had no idea it ran nine seasons. I knew that Meghan Markle was in it. And, you know, Meghan Markle, she's a, she's, a, she's a dish, man. That girl's a very attractive woman. I understand. I didn't realize that the show ran that long and I didn't realize. I thought she was like appeared as an extra or something. I didn't, you know, what do I know? I, I, I'm a cinema guy. I, I don't, don't watch a lot of modern TV. Much to my chagrin and obviously I'm missing out. So anyway... There was an article in the LA Times, and this was from August, set, August 2nd of this year, and it was written by Robin Avakarian. And let me read it to you. And I, I found this, and I, I actually agreed with it. And this is, the wrong, this is the wrong article, so let me go to this one. Column. Need a respite from Trump, DeSantis, the Bidens, and global warming? Check out Suits. Okay. And by the way, for both of these articles, both from the LA Times, they use the same picture of Meghan Markle. Um, again, Robin Abakarian, August 2nd, at th it was published at 3.02 a.m. Last month, tired of watching cable news shows between dinner and bedtime, I clicked on Netflix. As usual, I wasn't looking for anything in particular. I just needed some relief from the stream of stupid news out of Florida, the terrible stories about killer heat waves, and God help us, the obsession with Hunter Biden's laptop and custody issues. As if summoned by a higher power to cheer me up, suits suddenly appeared on my Netflix home screen. Suits. Had I unconsciously wanted to see what Meghan, formerly Markle, now the Duchess of Sussex, looked and acted like before she teamed up with Prince Harry and became the undeserved villain of British tabloids and Buckingham Palace conspirators everywhere? Or was I manipulated by Netflix's seductive algorithm to click on Suits, a USA Network series I never saw during its nine-season run, which ended in 2019? nor had ever particularly wanted to see. It's a mystery. But something is afoot. This week, the Washington Post described the long-defunct Suits as the hit show of the summer. Its, creer, its creator, Aaron Korsh, is bemused. Never in a million years thought Suits would be three of top seven seasons of TV, he tweeted. The series' resurgent popularity has also raised questions about how actors currently on strike demanding better deals, are compensated for reruns. With the show pulling such huge numbers nearly four years after its finale, reported the website Den of Geek, many people have been wondering if the actors and writers will gain anything from the billions of views their show is bringing to these streaming services. I hope the residuals are pouring in because I'm addicted to Suits, a legal drama in the mold of the old L.A. law. It features handsome men in beautifully tailored, yes, suits. Women in skin-tight office attire teetering on high, sky-high stilettos and witty Aaron Sorkin-esque repartee. Suits, in other words, is pure escapism. Not much about it rings true to life. From Michael Ross, the gifted young con man with the heart of gold, played by Patrick J. Adams, whose photographic memory allows him to masquerade as a Harvard Law graduate, to his mentor, Harvey Specter, the slick, amoral senior partner, played by Gabriel Macht, whose world-class smirk perfectly befits a dude who never met a case he couldn't win or a woman he couldn't bed. Is there a comic book superhero called The Smirk? If not, there should be. The women in suits are spectacular. From the firm's managing partner, Jessica Pearson, played by the statuesque Gina Torres, to Spectre's sexy and eternally loyal secretary, Donna Paulson, played by Sarah Rafferty. And of course, there's the spunky paralegal turned law student, Rachel Zane, played by Meghan Markle, whose knife-thin body is the perfect hanger for unforgivingly snug suits and tops. Blissfully, blissfully I'm only on to the second season, so there's enough suits to last me to the end of the summer. I understand from what I've read that the seasons go along, the cast as well, the cast as well as relationships change, but don't give me spoilers. Markle, who left the show in 2017, is the breakout star of the series, though not in the typical Hollywood sense of the phrase. After she coupled up with Prince Harry, she became famous in that most fractured fairy tale of ways and had to give up her successful acting career. You simply cannot be a working member of the British royal family and hold down an honest job at the same time. 
nor can you apparently be a successful, divorced, outspoken, biracial American career woman and thrive among the hierarchically ossified, stiff upper lip royal family. In any case, after breaking with the Windsors, Harry and Meghan have had to mostly fend for themselves. They inked rich deals with streaming services, a reported $100 million deal with Netflix for various documentaries and series, and a reported $20 million plus deal with Spotify for podcasts and audio shows. Spotify, whose stock spiked in 2020 on news that it had signed the semi-royals, dropped them three years later, leading to speculation that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex had flopped. The official line was that two sides mutually parted ways, but industry insiders said that the couple could just not come up with enough good, executable ideas for podcasts or audio shows. Megan's primary effort, Archetypes, in which she interviewed famous people about the cultural forces and expectations that thwart women, met with some initial success but was not renewed by Spotify. As soon as the Spotify deal went south, negative stories the Sussexes began to circulate. She'd not conducted all the series interviews herself. She and Harry, in the words of Spotify executive Bill Simmons, were grifters. Well, that's a bit rich. Companies that throw scads of money at people simply because they're famous and fascinating need to take some ownership of their decisions. Meghan and Harry have demonstrated that the world will eat up their personal stories and their troubles with the royal family, expecting them to bring a whole lot more than that to the creative table without a lot of help seems a bit of a stretch. Netflix, on the other hand, has insisted its deal with the couple is still intact. Its six-part docuseries, Harry and Meghan, which chronicled their relationship from its inception to the move to California, was a success last year. I can vouch for that. I even watched it. That was followed by almo- that was followed almost immediately by the release of Harry's bridge burner of a memoir, Spare, an instant bestseller, the fastest selling nonfiction book of all time, according to Guinness World Records, that reportedly earned the prince a twenty million advance. Betting on Harry paid off for Penguin Random House. A plug here for Harry's ghostwriter, J. R. Moringer, whose literary talents undeniably elevated the memoir. And despite rumors to the contrary, Netflix Netflix insists that Harry's Heart of Invictus docuseries will debut this summer. The series follows a group of wounded war veterans from around the globe as they compete in the 2022 Invictus Games in The Hague. Harry founded the Games in 2014 after serving in Afghanistan. For most of the pop culture conscious world, this is the summer of Barbie and Oppenheimer. Both those films are fine ways to pass a few hours. For me, though, this is the summer of suits. I'm talking about 134 42-minute episodes with no commercials, no former presidents, no Florida governors, no drug-scarred first families, no tortured analysis of the patriarchy, and no atomic bombs. Just fluff. These days, that is my idea of heaven. Again, that was an article in the LA Times. It was written by uh, Robin uh, Abakarian. And it was published on August 2nd. Now, what was interesting when I read that article, I was like, oh, I'm like Robin Abakarian because I, too, stumbled across Suits on Netflix. And I watched it, and it sucks you in. It's a good show. The actors are appealing. The scripts are tight. It's fun to watch. There is witty witty repartee. And that's what you want. That's what you want out of these shows. But then, but then, there was another article in the LA Times that used the same picture and why not now this was on august 9th and this uh this uh appeared on august 9th and let's let's delve into it shall we okay opinion i helped write the surprise netflix sensation suits and my reward was 259 dollars and 71 cents now when I read this headline, let me just explain to you where I'm coming from. I read this headline and I'm like, okay, uh, you helped write the surprise Netflix sensation suits. Bro, I get what you mean, but that's a pretty disingenuous headline. You did not write or helped write the surprise Netflix sensation suits. I understand it's that now. It went off the air four years ago. It was written over nine seasons, and it was on USA to start. So let's go. Let's back it up. And when I read this headline, I'm like, okay, 
I get where he's coming from. He's gonna he's a writer who's gonna make a point. But I just want to point out that Netflix paid a healthy I don't know how much they paid. I don't think they paid maybe they did, but I don't think they paid the hundred million dollars that they paid for for friends in twenty nineteen. They paid something. But whatever they paid, your residuals are not paid by Netflix. There's no money coming from Netflix. The money from Netflix went to those production companies, Universal Content, and the other three production companies that made suits. They got whatever their negotiated piece was of whatever the licensing fee was that Netflix paid to the owners of the show to license it out. Netflix paid a lot of money for your show. Let's be clear on that. That's why this, this headline pissed me off because it's, it, I get what he's saying. Okay, and when Netflix paid whatever their licensing fee was, they didn't know that Suits was going to become as successful on their platform as it has. Maybe they had some analytics. Maybe they had some Oracle at Delphi that told them, well, you know, dead network shows that are have run their course. This is what they're going to make if we license them. They don't know. I mean, how many times has Netflix licensed a show like Designated Survivor or the Eric McCormack Time Traveler show? Travelers that I really liked. They bought it and they decided themselves to produce a final season. And then after three seasons, up, oh, no more. That's the end of that show. And you're never going to see, Netflix is never going to pay for a show. Not even Stranger Things is going to go nine seasons. So anyway, they paid money to the people that owe you based on whatever your contract is. And if something's on USA, how many times did Suits air when it was earning uh, money from being uh, uh, a show where they have to have sell advertising on it. So how much did you already make? Oh, those. I this is. I only say this because it's this kind of stuff that muddies the water and makes people think. It it, it takes away from the reality of the situation. Now remember, this is my opinion, and this is just the headline. But let's read this article, okay? And this is by Ethan Drogan. And it was published August 9th in the LA Times. I helped write the surprise Netflix sensation Suits. As if it was brand new, right? In America, unprecedented success begets unprecedented wealth. When Michael Jordan wins six championships or Mark Zuckerberg invents social media, they earn billions. Yes, because they control what they made. They made it themselves, and it was all their effort. And not only them, but also their teammates the people whose contributions weren't just meaningful but necessary, like Eduardo Saverin. No, I'm kidding. I mean, he made a lot of money, but you know what I mean. You saw the social network. In success, they get paid too, but not in Hollywood. Here, when you write for a show that becomes an unprecedented success, there is no such windfall. There is only a check for $259.71. Okay. Okay. First of all, that isn't true. I mean, it theoretically you could say it is true because the show wasn't made for Netflix. It wasn't made by Netflix. Netflix bought it four years after it went off the air, after its final ninth season aired. And I'm sure that everybody who worked on Suits when it was being produced by Universal Content got paid what they negotiated with their agent and manager because everybody who's working on a show like Suits has those people. They got paid. Look. I've said this on the show for four and a half years. You do not get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. That's what you get. And that's all you get. And I'm just saying, and I get where you're going with this, but but Ethan, I don't think you're being truthful here. And I don't think it helps when you write op-eds like this. And by the way, Ethan, if you're upset with me and somebody tells you about this, please you have an open invitation to come on the show. I will let you opine for a half an hour, and I promise you I will listen and not say a word. But I would love to have you come on the show, and um, uh, um, please, uh, I would love to have you rebut this. Um, but not in Hollywood. Here, when you write for a show that becomes an unprecedented success, there is no such windfall. There's only a check for $259.71. First of all, Suits was a success, and it ran nine seasons. And in this day and age, that's a huge success. And I would love to know, please, and it's only fair, if you're going to start 
talking about your residual checks, how much were you paid to work on the show? How much were you paid to write your scripts? What have the residuals been that you received already? It's not fair that you just give us a residual payment from now that it's on Netflix. You got to tell us the whole story. It's only fair. It doesn't matter whether the show you helped build generates 3.1 billion viewing minutes in one week across Netflix and NBC Universal's Peacock, setting a Nielsen record. It doesn't matter whether the said show constitutes 40% of Netflix's top 10. Well, <laughs> uh, none of that was necessarily going to be true, uh, ever. And so it does matter because the show is in a second life that is, first of all, unprecedented and unexpected. And, you know, if somebody had anticipated this, if the Writers Guild had anticipated it and thought about these things, uh, if they thought about this when they made House of Cards back in the day, but nobody did, you people have got to start thinking 10 years down the line. You cannot be playing catch-up all the time. This is you playing catch-up, man. And it's I just don't think it's right. You're making it sound like I'm part of this success of Netflix. Even Netflix didn't know they were going to have this kind of success. They don't know. They don't know where Suits is coming from. They Maybe their analytics told them, and if that's the case, then somebody should have known that. But anyway, $259.71. That's how much the, suit episode I, the Suits episode I wrote, Identity Crisis, earned last quarter in streaming residuals. Altogether, Universal paid the six original Suits writers less than $3,000 last quarter to stream our 11 season one episodes on two platforms. Yes, because if you go back to the WGA rules that were set in 1950, whatever, 56, let's go back. Um, I mean, I did bring them all up here, but that's what the guild pays for a show that's as old as it is. How many, how many, how many residuals did you already get paid? You don't get paid residuals forever. And the situation has changed. Is there a residual? This is what, uh, by the way, to be fair, this is what the WJ is negotiating right now. Yes, it's gratifying that the show has found a new and bigger audience this summer on Netflix. Every writer and actor hopes their work will endure. And yes, I'm grateful to have been in the engine room of Suits for eight of its nine seasons. But $259.71 for writing a show with an audience so massive... What did you get paid when it was originally on the air? What did you get paid when it was originally on the air? You're making a point that is a disingenuous point. It's not fair to say this because Suits is played out, man. The fact that it had a second life. Now, if that's the case, then the WGA needs to negotiate. They need to look at a situation like this. And by the way, they have. They can look at friends. They can look at this. The people should get paid more residuals. But here's the thing. Netflix paid a lot of money to run Suits. They don't know how Suits is going to do when they pay a lot of money for it. The fact that it explodes, they don't know. So where's the extra money? Where's Netflix's extra money? You're you're making it sound like you're 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 talking about a show that went off the air in 2019. 4 years ago. Now it has a second life. But your, your, what you were owed played out. You got paid. You got paid. Netflix comes along, pays a bunch of money to the people that own the show, and now you're writing articles in the LA Times. I don't mean to harp on you, but what you're saying is not exactly you got paid what you negotiated. And the fact that your show has resurgence, you know what you do? You have your agent, your manager, whoever your people are. Your team should capitalize on this and go get another job. Go set yourself up and make your own show that you have ownership of. Now, I get it. I understand. I don't mean to sound like I'm some corporate shill, but I'm not. But you get what you negotiate. And I'm sure because you were on for eight seasons, you must have done quite well. Maybe not as well as an Aaron Spelling show in the 80s. But if you were on this show for eight years, that's one of the better runs in television history. Probably upper echelons of however many TV shows there are. And I'm sure you did okay over those. And am I saying that you shouldn't get paid for 
the immediate success. I'm saying that Netflix has shelled out money. The only money they have coming back in is their subscriptions that have to pay for everything on their platform. The fact that Suits became unex- uh, unexpectedly the most successful, it's, it's as much of a fluke as anything else. But Netflix paid for that privilege. They paid a lot of money. Your beef is with the people that own Suits, not Netflix. If Netflix had paid to produce the show, maybe. But $259.71 for writing a show with an audience so massive, this is why writers and actors are on strike. This is why SAG after President Fran Drescher has used terms such as un-American to describe this system. Entertainment executives argue that they are offering writers historic raises. The thing is, even a 100% increase on $259.71 check doesn't come close to paying most people's rent. You are That check you're getting from Netflix is not what you are being paid to work on this show. And as a producer myself, I'm like, that's not cool, man. I mean, if you, you should talk about what you got paid to work on suits and what your work, how valuable your work can be. Like, I would couch your argument and say, look, when we were making suits, we had, I worked on it, you worked on it, as you said, for eight years. I would like to know about the conditions that, what were the conditions like in the suits writer's room? Were you allowed to go to set and oversee your own episodes? Were you allowed to contribute in the edit of those episodes? Could you give notes? How much responsibility did you have when Suits was being made in the first place? And did you get paid commensurate with those responsibilities? That's what I'd be interested in. And that's what the Writers Guild is fighting for. They're also fighting for residuals on these kinds of shows. But how many times does this happen? This is a fluke. This is an anomaly. You can't hold Suits success up as some amazing thing that happens in the industry all the time because it doesn't work that way. I'm just saying. Being underpaid is part of the problem. The other part, not being paid at all. Suits became so popular globally that it was licensed and remade in South Korea, Japan, and Egypt. When that happens, studios are supposed to pay the writers for the source material. They are... And uh, did you have that in your deal? Did you have that in your contract? Because that stuff is in contracts, it is negotiable, and it probably should have been there. But a couple of quarters after the Egyptian version of Suits began airing last year, I asked the Writers Guild of America to look into why I hadn't been paid. So far, the Guild's small but intrepid enforcement team has been stonewalled. That's a point I can get behind. That's a point that I'm like, yeah, man. That's some bullshit right there. And that's what the Writers Guild should step in. And this is bullshit. This is a point you're like, yeah. If But then again, do you have ownership over the creation of the show? Were you, I would imagine, after eight years, you would have been a co-EP of the show, which means your ownership should have changed, which means, you know, all of this stuff should have been very well documented. But if it wasn't. A lack of equitable compensation is valid enough reason to strike, and one that most Americans can relate to. Writers and actors are merely the latest arrivals in this late-stage capitalist purgatory. I agree with that, too. But this fight is about much more than what writing an episode of Suits is worth. It's about how entertainment is made and paid for more broadly. Amen. Whether you're an airport baggage handler or a school teacher or a television writer, you rely on a whole team to get the job done well. Aaron Korsh, the creator of Suits, worked for two years to craft a compelling pilot and made all the big decisions that guided everything we did. But a mock trial episode that truly elevated the series came from Erica Lopez, the sixth writer hired. Without Lopez's contributions, there would still be a show. Without any three of us, there would still be a show. But it wouldn't be Suits. You can't subtract Sean uh, Jablonski's subversive edge, John Cowan's storytelling know-how, or Rick, and this is a tough one, Mirigui, Mirigui laugh-out-loud dialogue and have season one that lays the foundation for another eight. In recent years, streamers have exerted downward pressure on the number of writer-producers who work on shows and stripping early and mid-career writers out of the casting, production, and editing processes. 
on Suits, writers participated in every step of their episodes, which contributed to the show's quality. That rarely happens now. A very great point. And the fact that the show is as good as it is and the fact that it endures is proving his point. And I agree with him. An overlooked aspect of the strike is that writers and actors are fighting to protect the quality of the shows that people watch. The resurgence of Suits comes at an opportune moment for executives. The business is shut down. They have time to take stock of what has worked and what hasn't. Among the questions they might ask, what does it say that a show that debuted 12 years ago is outperforming dozens of newer original series that Netflix has spent hundreds of millions of dollars producing that are also written by WGA members? So, what is the real value of the limited series that streamers have been cranking out? Are viewers as likely to revisit short-lived, ripped-from-the-headlines one-offs about corporate scandals or small-town murders as they are a fully developed, long-running drama? Are viewers craving more carnage and darkness or cable news sermonizing? Or are they hungry for shows that leave them feeling good? Well, what about the 10-episode seasons of Succession? Or the 10-episode seasons of House of the Dragon? Only the streamers can determine what kind of content they produce and distribute. Writers and actors are powerless to negotiate that. I don't know. But many artists are certain that what is broken about Hollywood isn't just compensation. It's what be, it's what's being made and why. Unlike many shows today, Suits wasn't made out of fear. Alex C. Peel, the executive most responsible for championing the series, bet that viewers would respond to a show with an unknown creator and mostly an unknown cast because the material was simply that funny and human. More than a decade later, that bet is still paying off. If only it were paying off for the actors and writers who helped make it a winner. Ethan Drogan is a television writer and producer. Ethan, uh, half of what you said I totally agree with. But like everything, it's always a crapshoot what's going to get made and what the public is going to like. You're not going to know exactly what that is. But when you made Suits, it was a good job. For eight years, I bet you were the envy of most of your television writer friends. And and that's the thing. You make all of these great points, these very salient points about what writers deserve and what shows get made. And the fact that one executive championed the show. And nowadays with these Wall Street... Look, I... Everyone who watches this pro this program, this channel, knows that I am always railing against the people that are working at the studios because they know less and less, dare I say, fuck all about what should and shouldn't get made. And there's plenty of creators, I've called them fraudulent creators, who are in positions of power who are making just shite over and over again. Or there's people that are hires for other reasons that are not qualified to be where they are. And they're affecting the quality of shows as well. So it's, it's a tough call all the way around. But I would say this. The success of Suits, while Suits was being made by all the people that created it and all of your very tremendously talented writing staff and the production company Universal Content Creators and the three other comp- companies that made the show, I would imagine why Suits was being made, you were perfectly well compensated because I don't remember finding an article that you'd written in the LA Times about how you weren't getting paid while you were writing Suits. You're only upset now because Suits is a big success four years later. Well, the reason you're not getting paid is because nobody anticipated this situation at the WGA 10 years ago. I was talking to a writer that worked on a, on a Netflix show, and they still haven't figured out the residual schedule. And it was a very big show when it was made. The fact is the guilds have always been behind the eight ball. They, are, they should be 10 years ahead, and they're fighting to get stuff that was 10 years ago. And that's what we need is we need smarter people that really anticipate what's going on because – As you well know, the studios and the money people will find any excuse to pay you less, which means we're going to get sucky entertainment. I mean, just look at Star Trek. My God. But anyway, that's that's what I wanted to discuss. And by the way, Ethan, I don't mean to slag off on you. I don't even know you. I'm sure you're a perfectly great guy. And after now delving into suits, it's a great show. So you guys did a great job. But... You know, I just think that this this article, this this essay, this op-ed you wrote, 
little wishy-washy for me. I'd love to talk to you and learn more because I don't know enough. So I'll freely admit that, but now I've responded to your article, and you did make me want to do this entire uh, episode of Rob's Ovation, so I thank you for that because you were the inspiration for this episode. Let's see what anybody else has to say. Um, um, Glenn Mark says, last one is Modern Trek written for 7th graders. <laughs> Rob Star Trek Season 2, Episode 17, The Mark of Nickelodeon. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, the Mark of Gideon was a third season episode, though, but I'll, I'll, that's fine. I'll go with that one. That was a pretty good one. Um, Kevin, uh, Kevin, I always say Kevin. Kelvin Wellborn says, Killdozer, I've been obsessed with it since late night in the 70s. Me too, Kelvin. That's when I first saw it, Killdozer. And if you haven't seen Killdozer, why haven't you? Um, it's great. Scott Bartholomew says, Wait until AI manipulates viewership and the ratings of TV and film. I don't know if they will. I mean, now we've got the greatest analytics ever. Maybe they will. RRTNZ says, when Chuck Norris jumps off a boat, he doesn't get wet. The water gets Chuck Norris. Also, have a peek at Toast of London. It's hilarious. Cheers. Well, thank you. Um, Thomas Logan says, Ethan deserves all the money in Hollywood. Hashtag all of it. I know, right? I'm right there with you, son. Uh, Rogue Comics became a new member of the channel. Well, thank you. Um, Latino Slant became a member. Latino Slant's been a member. polly has been a member of this channel for 26 months. Uh, love my brother R&B. Keep preaching the imagination gospel. By the way, if you people don't uh, subscribe to Latino Slant, if you don't become Slantinos on YouTube, you should. Polly does some great work. And by the way, I'm very happy for him because... He's uh, doing uh, the work to promote Blue Beetle, and if early word is to be believed, it's turned out to be quite a great film, and what makes it so great is the representation of a Latino family, which I think is great. That was one of the great strengths of Miss Marvel over at Marvel on TV was the, the, the family dynamic, so that's pretty great. Uh, Culture Wars Diplomacy says what percentage of what Netflix paid for the suits for suits is going to every person's residuals that's the real question well according to Ethan uh, we know the answer to that and what he got uh, initially and probably it was a one-time payout for whatever he wrote uh, was 200 and some odd dollars um, Thomas Logan says Bobby you owe Ethan money for reading his article I probably do I probably do owe Ethan money but I'm also I would say that the audience that I've built up on this channel, uh, the fact that now people know his name, Ethan, um, maybe people will go find, and, and if he comes on the channel, by the way, I promise I'll be perfectly, uh, perfectly nice, and um, uh, I would love to have him come on the channel. I don't know him, you know, uh, and he's on the picket line. He can't come on. Actually, Ethan can't come on and talk about. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm I'm I haven't flipped over on my. So you're watching me zip through the article. I apologize for that. I should go back to the screen. Um, Ethan can't come on this show and talk about suits because that would be a violation of WJ strike rules. And so I guess, Ethan, I'll wait till after the strike. Love you to come on the show and talk about it. You have an open invitation. And um, hey, look, I read your article and I haven't stopped thinking about it, which is why I wanted to do this. So yeah, and you're probably right, Thomas. I do owe him for reading the article. But, you know, what can you do? Um, all I can do is find things interesting and share them with you. That's 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 what this channel is all about. Um, well, listen, everybody. That's all I wanted to say. And uh, I wanted to do this show. And I want to thank everybody. 484 people for uh, are here right now watching. Um, thank you all for watching. I don't know if anybody wants to fire in any other questions. You know, I... Um, I just want to thank you for uh, for watching. Tomorrow, of course, Dieter is back. We're doing Let's Get Physical Media, episode 118. So join us at 11 a.m. for that. That should be pretty uh, pretty exciting. So, you know, can't uh, can't complain there. And um, I, you know, it's going to be interesting. Culture wars diplomacy. I wonder if we're going to find out 
how much I'd, – I'd be curious too. You know, you've got nine seasons of a show and the residual payments that come out, maybe, maybe, maybe Netflix didn't pay as much as we would have thought, um, which could be the case. I mean, I don't know, to be honest. I have no idea. Uh, Owen Hampton says, you're a national treasure. Well, I'll tell you, if I'm that, if I'm a national treasure, do I get some like government subsidy to keep me freshly watered or something? But thank you. That's that's uh, that's very nice, Owen. I I very much appreciate it. Kenneth Colton says, "Rob, don't leave me." Um, well, I I I, um, I I I I don't want to leave you, Kenneth. I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm I'm willing to hang out. I I just I'm I I wasn't planning on after this. I can look and see if I have to. <laughs> um, I can read an article. I mean, a letter. I don't think Mike sent me any more letters. I don't know if I've missed any. Uh, Scott Bartholomew asks, do you have a gut feeling when the strike will end? Well, you know, they met Friday and they're going to reopen negotiations. It's going to be really interesting to see what happened. Um, I, I, that's a very good question. I mean, I think they're really far apart. I don't see, there's so many interesting questions about moving into the future. I mean, I, I, I just don't know what's going to happen. The things about getting paid and residuals and having enough time to do things and the actual methodology of work is, is I think, needs to be ironed out, I think. And by the way, it benefits everybody in the long run. It really does, because the better the shows, the more time you have to make them, the more valuable they are, if they're good shows written by great people and run by talented showrunners, as evidenced by Suits as evidenced by a lot of shows that people watch, the good shows, and look at the Emmy Award winners, or nom- pardon me, the Emmy nominees, both in comedy and in drama. This is great stuff, and, and the reason they're so great is because of the writing. And that's what you want writers to have the time to do their work. All great TVs and movie, All great TV shows and movies begin with the writing. And to skimp on that, I mean, everybody wants to skimp on everything, and I understand that. But at the end of the day, you know, there's that rule: you get something, uh, you get something good, fast, or the third one. You get one of the two. I forget what the third one is, but um, yeah. Thomas Logan says, "For the love of George C. Scott, phone Dave Parker." I could do that. Um, I could I could do that. I don't know if he'll answer the phone, but why not? I could call him. I had a really interesting phone conversation today with somebody I'd love to tell you all about, but I can't. Let's see if he's home. You breached the control activation line, but I see the phone you're calling from is already activated. I can give you some tips on that. As part of this call and subsequent in this call. What? That's odd. Welcome to the T Mobile payment line. As- payment? I just paid my bill. This is odd. I just used my phone. How odd. How strange. Um, weird. I guess my phone is uh, not working. Did I not pay the bill? It's on auto pay and all that. Crazy. I have to look into that. Um, so I guess I can't call Dave. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, two things that are strange. So I'll call Dave Parker later. The Richard says... What's your favorite Pee Wee Herman film and show, and why? He was an idol of mine. Top five. Well, I have to say Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And in terms of, I also loved him in um, Blow. I thought he was great in Blow. Love that. Glenn Mark says, Laon's character history is dumb, but let her sing. Okay, that's bad. That's just bad. Um, I don't get it. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like that. Look, the idea that anybody, the idea that Khan Noonie and Singh has a, um, that has a, a, uh, legacy, like he has a, uh, he'd have to have a kid that was left on earth when they left, like, wouldn't he take any progeny he had with him? Like they took 96, they took 96, um, Superman into, into, uh, into the void think he would leave his kid behind doesn't make any sense there would be 
know. And if there was, you're 300 years away from the eugenics wars. Why would anyone care? It's bizarre. I don't understand it. I really don't. I don't get it at all. I don't see what that means. So there you go. By the way, um, T-Mobile are not grifters. I love T-Mobile. I've never even heard that first message before. I don't know if that's uh, if that has just happened or what. It was really odd. I'd never heard that thing, which is strange. Um, I love T. I, by the way, I love T-Mobile. They've been the best phone service I've ever had. Love them. But since I'm not calling Dave Parker, I'm sorry, Thomas. I got to figure this one out. I don't know why my phone. That used that used to happen to me all the time. Um, let's see. Let me just make sure. Let me just check the old tip line, and uh, see if that. Where am I? Where am I at? I'm. I'm missing. Where did everything go? Let me just check because I think somebody did. Uh, you get what you pay for, right? Um, no, we're good. I think we're good. Uh, Destiny Captain sent a tip in and said, Mr. Burnett, can we skip the quiz today? Do we have a quiz? Do we, did we have a quiz today? Um, I don't know if we did or not, but I, I thank you for that, Destiny Captain. And, uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess I'll end the show. I have nothing more to say, really, about this whole thing. I think I said it all, but I want to thank you all for being here and watching the show, which is great. Now I've got to f figure out what's up with my phone considering I used it not an hour ago before I got on the stream. Anyway, how do you shut someone's phone off on Saturday night at 11.40 at night? I don't know. If there's some way to do it, I'm your guy. But on that note, again, come join Dieter Bastian and I tomorrow at 11 for Let's Get Physical Media. And I want to thank everybody for generously supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great moderator. And I don't know who else is here moderating. Um, <laughs> uh, Glenmark says, do you want me to scrub that one off the timestamps? No, because it was hilarious. Uh, keep it. Keep it on there. Chemist says, thoughts on the HBO sci-fi show Raised by Wolves? You know, I thought Raised by Wolves was pretty good. There was a lot of interesting ideas, and then it got kind of weird. I, I wish it was a little bit more focused, and I didn't dig the second season nearly as much. So... Uh, Mashby says, thank you, Rob, for broadcasting tonight. It's always a treat to hear your knowledge of the happenings in the entertainment industry. Well, thank you for that. I very much appreciate that. Um, <laughs> T-Mobile phone, ET mobile phone home. That's hilarious. Um, but thank you. I very much appreciate that. And I don't know. I think, Tom, I think you're the only person here. Um, but thanks a lot for that. Now, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear and all you have to do is listen and with that i would say to all of you have a better day and enjoy suits on netflix because it's a lot of fun <laughs>